What's going on friends? Back in January we hosted what we like to call the HRX or High Res Expo, which is a gaming convention that us at High Res host every single year. It's a chance for people to come out and meet other fans of High Res games, watch the Smite World Championship, watch the Paladins World Championship, and check out cool new games that we're making, including Bot Smashers, which is the game that I've been secretly working on for about the last year or so. Uh, it'll be a mobile game, kind of fun arcade, RTS, battle arena kind of game. Um, and it's pretty, pretty cool. I'm excited to share that with you soon. Hopefully we'll go into public testing over the next few months. But during HRX this year, I did something brand new for myself. I actually cosplayed for the first time. What's cool about this is I've actually been around cosplay for a long time, right? Going around at Gamescom, TwitchCon, PAX, RTX, all these different gaming conventions around the world. I've been immersed in and basically exposed to cosplay for a while. Um, so I kind of know a little bit about how it works and we've you know had cosplayers come and cosplay the characters in our games, which is really cool. Or we've you know hired cosplayers that would come and, and just be there for our events and show off really awesome cosplays. But this year I really wanted to try something new and see if I could do cosplay myself. And it turned out to be a lot of fun. So what I wanted to do is share for you guys what that cosplay experience was like for me, how I did it, and some of the things that I did differently. Now, being an engineer, before I joined the gaming industry, uh, specifically electrical and, mecha mechan electrical and computer engineering, um, I tried to lean on that experience to make my own kind of cosplay. I made some interesting uh, new things and learned some lessons along the way, so I'll share that with you. But one of the cool things is actually for the character I chose in Bot Smashers, which by the way is the world first Bot Smasher cosplay ever, which is going to be uh, probably the best you've ever seen. Um, it won't be. <laughs> what I did is I actually made uh, the character, which I'll show you on screen, has two drills for hands. His name is Drill Punch. Um, pretty great, right? Um, he has two drills for hands, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring that to life. I wanted to actually have moving drills, have lights on the character, and kind of go the, the extra mile. Um, and so what I did is I ended up making these drills, which have a motor on the inside, and they actually have a wired up battery. And then on the handle on the inside here, which is pretty sturdy, there's a little switch you can hit, which turns it on and off. And so I can make sure the battery doesn't go out during the day while I'm cosplaying and showing it off to the people that are at the event. Um, and I had two of them, so this is just one of them. Um, so I'll go through basically how I accomplished that, some of the challenges I faced and how I overcome them, some of the lessons I learned in cosplay, what was fun about it for me. Um, and what I will probably do is end up breaking out a different video too on how to use motors, how to use batteries, how to solder wiring and stuff like that. So you actually create cool things, which maybe there might be uh, some people out there that are interested in that sort of thing. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. I chose Drill Punch generally for his relative simplicity. He's obviously a very blocky shape, simple colors, so it wouldn't require me a lot of fine details that I wouldn't have as a skill set early on, just trying for the first time. Uh, but it also allowed me some cool opportunities for the drills and the eye to light up and put some cool electrics in there that would just have an overall aesthetic that I could enjoy. It's something that you really look at say I. Now jumping into cosplay for the very first time, there were some assumptions that I had made about how cosplay worked that were totally wrong. I, I, okay, so I learned a lot about the painting and, and how to actually make the paint stick to foam. I hadn't worked with foam before. I had used it and kind of helped people transport their cosplay, but I didn't actually craft it myself. So plus to learn there. So. Logic to me dictated that I should start with the biggest piece, which is the body. One of the reasons why I chose Drill Punch in the first place is it just it, I could just make a frame and just put it on, my, on myself, and then all of a sudden I would have a cosplay, right? There wasn't a, lot, a whole lot of like little baby bits that I would get lost in the sauce on. So being the engineer that I am, I was like, you know what? Let's use some wood. It was heavy. <laughs> And, and so like I had friends that are like they do cosplay and I was like telling them about as, as I was working on it They're like don't use wood. You're crazy. I was like that's fine. I'll use I'll use white pine It'll be really lightweight. I'll, I'll use a lot of wood glue instead of uh, brackets and fasteners uh, Light and you know like galvanized steel instead of some of the heavier metals that would kind of like weigh me down It'll work out great, man it was, it was still pretty heavy, so I, I probably could only wear the cosplay for about two hours before I started to really feel it, and then um, I didn't properly pad the shoulders well enough, so it kind of dug in onto me. Um, so what I did is I just, I went to Home Depot, I picked up a whole bunch of white pine, I got out my jigsaw, and I started going to work to make the body and just frame it around myself. 
Now this part was pretty straightforward. I had long strips of pine that I would just measure to my body length, uh, from shoulders down to about my waist. I wanted to leave enough room for my hips and my legs to move freely without bumping into this thing a lot. Uh, so once I got the measurements down, I used a tape measure and a pencil and I started just using the jigsaw to cut through the pine. And then I used these kind of very mixed metal lightweight brackets to screw in the wood to the corners to kind of build a frame, almost like a picture frame for my body. The reason I used the fasteners here and not glue is I really wanted this thing to stand the test of time so it wouldn't fall apart. In my heart of hearts, I like things that are stable and don't break. I know that's kind of like the age old problem of cosplay is the more sturdy it is, the heavier and, and, and harder it is to kind of wear. Uh, but in my mind, I was like, this has to be something that'll last forever. Uh, so I used the, the brackets, I screwed everything together, and I built the frame around my body. Once I had the first frame, it was simple enough to make another one for the back, and then all I had to do was connect them together over the shoulders. Uh, now what I did is I connected them over the shoulders, but not at the bottom, because I knew I had to add the shoulder pads, and that would be my bridge to make sure it was stable, but I wanted to make sure that the bottom of the frame uh, was open so I could move left and right without being trapped inside of this fully contained wooden structure. Next I took some EVA foam, which is pretty cheap, you just buy it online. Uh, and used it to put on the front and the back and the top of it. Uh, EVA foam is pretty standard. You actually find a lot of guides online on how to use it. Um, it's, it's pretty common. The general idea here is to just kind of use a Sharpie on the back of it, the ugly side of it, to uh, cut out the right shape. And then I use some rubber cement to glue it to the outside frame of the wood. And then uh, after the fact, I used some very thin nails to kind of pin it down. I wasn't too uh, bullish on using nails and screws on this cosplay specifically, mainly because it is a robot. And so if they end up showing, it's fine. It just makes it look even more robotic and, and factory driven. Uh, so I was pretty uh, uh, pretty light on that or pretty heavy on that. I was not conservative at all. So I sort of threw that all over the place. Next up for the frame, I wanted to put on the shoulder guards. Uh, so in the drill punch, you can see that he has the general frame of his body, but then uh, coming off of that, protruding off of that are his arms, which are really just giant shoulder guards, and then uh, thin connections to the drills. And so I just had to kind of extend out this frame that I had created uh, the same exact way by uh, just creating some shoulder guards. Um, so I just used the, the same brackets, the same wood, uh, extended it out about as much as I wanted. Again, similar to the bottom of the frame, I left the uh, bottom connection open so that I could actually move my elbows and my arms a little bit more uh, openly and then my body could kind of actually uh, move within the frame so it was a little bit more free form. Um, and then similar to the body, and then I started covering it in the EVA foam and getting prepped uh, to actually start coloring it. Okay, so now that it's all covered in foam, I was ready to prep the EVA foam to be painted. So I looked up some guides, you can find some online on how to do this. Uh, the ones that I found the uh, highest <laughs> ratings or seem the most logical to me uh, just use PVA glue, which is uh, kind of school glue that you'd, you'd find for arts and crafts uh, or when you're in kindergarten you're using PVA glue to put things together. So I just got a jug of it and I started mixing that with equal parts water and then I took a paintbrush and I just coated the entire thing, uh, since it's a single piece, in this PVA glue, let it dry and then I did that three times. And what was interesting to me is the foam started out really soft and then ever, as I kept coating it and coating it, it started to harden um, almost to more of like a uh, ceramic coat on the front, which made it obviously very realistic to paint and the paint would actually stick. Now, right before I painted, just because I'm a very cautious man and I don't really want to do things more than once if I don't have to, I did also pick up some Plasti Dip, which is uh, kind of like this um, construction material that they'll put to seal in rubberized uh, places or allows you to actually do a nice coat of plastic. Uh, they call it Plastic Dip, it's not really plastic, but it's uh, an adhesive that allows you to use on rubber. Um, so once it was fully coated in three of these layers of PVA glue, I coated it again in Plasti Dip, and this actually proved to be very effective in keeping the surface ready to be painted and ready to go. So now that the body is all prepped and painted and looking pretty and prim and proper and poised to be poignant on the pear pickled Pam, I don't know. <laughs> now that's ready to go, it's time to actually put the final touches on it to finish it out. Uh, so what I did is I actually cut out a square for the eye. Uh, shape, well, the black eye shape of Drill Punch, um, and then did the same process of foam. I treated it, painted it black, and then I uh, glued it and actually uh, screwed it to the front of the foam. 
And then what I did is I drilled a hole through the center of it with a pretty big uh, drill bit on my drill, put it right through the center, and then actually allowed it uh, to move a LED light through the front to actually have a blinking eye. And then I took an LED strip and I glued it to the bottom of the eye. Just to add some ambiance, let it glow a little bit and stand out more. And what I did is I poked both of these, the LED blinking eye and the LED strip, through the foam. And then I screwed on some 9 volt uh, holders onto the wood frame of the inside of the body so that I could actually wire these uh, LEDs to those and put a 9 volt in and turn them on or take the 9 volt out uh, when I'm not using it. And with the wires that are coming off the LEDs, all I did was just did a quick solder with some basic solder, took a soldering iron and soldered the wires from these LEDs to the 9 volt holder. And then that way it's all self-contained. I just put the battery in, there's nothing else I have to do. Um, and then I just taped the uh, excess wires to make sure they didn't dangle around and get pulled out. But that way I had this completely contained body with the lights. Uh, all set, ready to go. All I had to do is put two 9 volts in, one for each of the eye, for the eyeball and for the frame of the eye, and the, the suit glows, and then I could take it out and it wouldn't. It was just very easy to carry around. Grit your teeth! It's time to talk about the drills. So I made two of these, and they actually proved to be a little more complicated than I thought, but the goal going into making these was I wanted them to be uh, light enough to be held by me, uh, sturdy enough where they could kind of uh, rotate on their own and not you know, get bumped every now and then by people walking by and not fall apart in my hands. I wanted them to be fully self-contained. I didn't actually want to wire anything from my body or a backpack uh, or a fanny pack or anything like that to it. I wanted them to be fully contained with power, motor, and rotation all within themselves. Um, and so knowing that, I tried to figure out a way to accomplish all those goals at once. So first things first, I needed to figure out a uh, cone shape and um, a material that would be light enough to rotate around, which means I can get a lighter motor. I ended up only needing um, like a 120 RPM uh, geared DC motor that just could just go in and get the job done. And the lightness of the cone was a determining factor for that. So I actually found construction paper. Uh, I just got this from like a craft store, and this is where I got the actual shape for the cone. And I was really, <laughs> it was a bit of a risk, but I was I was banking on the fact that when I coated this in the PVA glue and, and treated it, that it would actually harden and become a little bit more robust. Because obviously construction paper, very floppy. I mean, it's got it's thicker than normal paper, obviously, but it definitely is still paper. Um, and so what I did is I just rolled um, a big sheet into a cone, um, cut it, and then just taped it together to keep the cone shape. And then from there, I needed to actually create the um, rotary mechanism on the inside. So I just picked up some gear DC motors uh, off the web, some pretty cheap ones. Um, these I just wouldn't be able to hook up to um, a battery that has enough voltage and enough current to make it spin um, at the at the spec that was necessary. Um, and then what I did is I picked up some robot wheels and then a shaft that I could attach to the motor. And the reason I did this is because the wheels would be really flexible. I could actually put them on almost anything or I can coat them in glue or I can stick them to something so I knew going into it this would be really valuable to me. So I picked up two motors and got two robot wheels, uh, just like kind of robotics wheels you use for like toy cars or RC cars, um, put those together. And then once I had that I wanted to double check to make sure that the motor spun the way I wanted to and that if uh, all things considered the drill itself wasn't too heavy, it spun at the rate that I wanted to and it would look pretty good. So I did some tests to make sure that worked right. And so here came the next idea I had. I wanted to have something that had a cone shape that would fit inside of my cone and would rotate my cone and would be sturdy so I could attach it to my wheel. And so I decided to get a cone. <laughs> I picked up some of these uh, real cheap uh, sports cones you can get for, you know, we, play, we were playing soccer or something. Um, and then I just put it on top of the wheel and it just found a good break point where the wheel was about the right circumference um, as the inside of the trap or the little you know, sports cone. And voila, all of a sudden I had this spinning rotation that I could put the really lightweight paper on top of and create the drill from. So now I know that my drill works, my spiral power is operating at maximum percentage. Uh, I need to make 
make a base that I can hold um, that will allow me to actually hold them in my hand without the drill falling apart. Uh, so what I did here is I picked up some real cheap plywood, um, something that is a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit thicker than the white pine, um, but you know, actually pretty cheap too. Uh, so you'll just kind of I you get that. So I just got a strip of it marked out uh, pretty close to a circle. It didn't really need to be an exact circle. It was just a platform for my drills. And then I just went in with the jigsaw. I cut out two uh, little discs out of it, made sure that it fit within the base of the cone. And then I picked up these um, these cheap gate handles <laughs> that you get for like an outside gate, uh, like in a garden or something. Um, and then I screwed them into the uh, each uh, one each into the base of the drills I actually at one point um, screwed them into into the desk I was working on and I had to unscrew them but uh, for the most part it all fit and in that way I've got these really cool bases um, for this or they could be shields for shield bashing you never know so I've got my bases I've got my motor spinning now I need to uh, you know pineapple apple pen them together to make sure that they actually work it was one unit so I need to find a way to mount the motor to the base and so what I decided is I'm going to take up some of that pine that I had earlier make a small um, plank out of it attach it to the base of the drill and then I got this uh, motor mount this little metal motor mount that I could put the motor into uh, that way I just know it's going to fit and it's going to be sturdy and then I just kind of screwed it all together um, unfortunately <laughs> While I was making this, I ended up uh, using a screw that was a little bit too long for the motor, uh, which ended up sticking deep inside the geared motor, um, and then it actually uh, pushed into one of the gears and broke one of the spokes on it, which, if the name geared motor is any indication, if the gear breaks on a geared motor, the motor's broken, so I actually had to take the motor apart, get the gear fixed, so it actually stick together and rotate again. Uh, but that was just, you know, another another faux pas as I'm going along. My motor is now mounted though and ready to be put back together. Just as a sanity check, I put the I put the wheel back on and then hooked it back up to the battery um, with some alligator leads just to make sure that everything is still working the way I expect it to. Um, it, and then I put the cone on top just to make sure I had clearance. It turned out that I didn't. <laughs> so at this point, since the clearance wasn't there, I didn't really have much time or energy to try and rip, like pull out the platform a base and try to do a different one. So what I did, which ended up working, which was pretty lazy, is I just took a sander, uh, an orbital sander, <laughs> and I just sand the edges of the platform, hopefully not getting into the screws, but it turned out that I found a nice breaky point where rounding out the edge of the uh, the pillar that was coming off the base uh, ended up allowing the cone down enough clearance to spin so I looked at on that one um, so now that I've got it all hooked up I've got the uh, cone on top it's now spinning I now need to make it a little bit more permanent and so what I did is I got some fresh um, about 12 gauge I think or 20 gauge some really thin thin wire uh, stripped it and then I wrapped it up on the motor and then soldered it all together so this was you know kind of more of a permanent solution with my soldering iron. Alright, now I've got it mounted to my base. I've got the motor ready to go. I've got it soldered and ready to hook up with the wire leads coming off of it. Now I need to get the cone on top of it. So this is actually where I had to get a little uh, creative because what I had thought originally is that I could uh, hot glue or super glue the wheel into the inside of the cone wasn't the case. So the inside of the cone was too slippery. I tried to sand it down and give it a good surface where the glue could stick, but no matter what I did when I stress tested it, the wheel, it kept snapping the glue. Maybe I was over stress testing it because I'm paranoid, maybe not, but either way I had to find a new way to get the wheel and the cone to stick together. So here's what I came up with, which was <laughs> kind of off the cuff, but it ended up working. So what I did is I drilled a hole through the cone and through the wheel and then I ran a screw through it in, in a, kind of a triangular formation, so like three screws total um, spaced out across the cone and the wheel. And then I would just take a bolt, like a little tiny bolt, um, and, and screw the bolt through the screw and just bind it all together. So I knew for sure this thing was not coming apart. There was a, a hard metal screw that was preventing this thing from coming out and that the cone was staying on the wheel as it spun in case someone bumped it or anything happened. So that ended up working out for me. Um, it was a little bit weird and I, you know, I, I had some mismatches on my alignment and measurements, but it all came together. 
Now, the last thing I wanted to do before I closed out and actually started putting the cone on top of uh, my entire contraption here is I wanted to be able to turn on and off the drill at my whim because I knew that if I left it connected to the battery, the battery would drain or it would just be really unruly to walk around with this drill in my hands that was spinning all the time and I had to take a battery out to do it. So I wanted it all to be one contained thing. So what I did is I bought these really, really cheap uh, like Radio Shack kind of uh, switches uh, where you just hit, a, you know, hit the switch, turns on, hit the switch, turns off. And then I drilled a hole through the base on each side uh, where the thumbs on either side would go so that I, you know, if I use my left drill, my right drill, this right next to my thumb is this button I can push to turn the drill on and off. Makes it super easy, uh, very clean, and actually made my life so much easier. And then obviously when people ask to hold the drill or see the drill, I can turn the drill off, hand it to them, they can turn the drill back on, and it's a pretty cool experience. It was awesome to show that off to certain people. So I drilled a hole into the base, just shoved the switch in there with the wire sticking out, and then I ran the uh, wiring circuit through uh, the motor so that the uh, positive of the switch went and connected to the motor uh, or went through the switch and then the switch would actually go to the battery so that the switch was in the middle between the motor and the battery but everything was grounded. That way that when the switch is on, the circuit's complete, the motor turns on. When the switch is off, the circuit is broken and then everything stays chill and relaxed. So that was uh, kind of hooked up there once I had that done. Done. I soldered it all together, made sure that was a, a good hit with the wires that I had, and then I moved on. Now I needed to hook up a power supply that could just be self-contained within the unit. I just found these little 9-volt battery holders at Fry's Electronics and then just uh, nailed the, or screwed them into the baseboard and then soldered the batteries into the whole circuit so that the batteries were part of it and relied on the switch to turn it on and off. Uh, once they are in, I could just pop in the 9 volts. I actually only needed to use two here, uh, luckily enough, to get the, the voltage and current I needed to actually pull together. Um, so once I had those in there, it was all self-contained. The switch protected the batteries from going out, and uh, yeah, I've got a drill. The drill now spins on its own. The circuit is hooked up and the switch is there so I can make it spin. Um, I'm pretty happy with the way it's moving. So now I obviously have the foundation and the function. I need to put in the aesthetic and the visual. So I need to uh, get those uh, construction paper cones onto the uh, traffic cone or the sports cone to make sure that it was attached tightly enough that it would spin with it. And then I need to go about actually creating the foam spiral that would actually create the drill shape. Um, interesting enough, I learned this throughout the process, but there's a name for the uh, that spiral pattern that's on a drill. There's actually two names. It's called a flute or flighting. The flute is actually when it's engraved into the uh, the drill when it goes into it and actually becomes uh, more like a drill bit. Um, and then when it's on the outside, which you'll see here with the drills I've made, it's called flighting. So a little bit of fun fact for you. So to get the construction paper onto the cone, it's very similar to the lesson I learned before where I just couldn't trust the <laughs> any kind of glue or adhesive to be strong enough and not break when it's under pressure. Um, I decided to use the screws that I had used to get the traffic, or the, sorry, the sports cone onto the motor with the wheel and then just have those extend out further so that I can get the same uh, screws sticking out and apply the construction paper to the cone the same way. Now, I couldn't really get it to stick properly, so what I did was uh, a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit creative. What I did is I actually took an extra sports cone and I cut out circular pieces of that really thick, heavy plastic. And then I cut into them and then cut out a small hole in the center, which essentially creates uh, what's called a lock washer, which is a kind of offset uh, washer that has a distortion to it. And then when you apply a lot of pressure to the lock washer, it tends to create a very good grab. And so I would put the lock washer, uh, the makeshift lock washers, out of the plastic around the uh, edge of the uh, screw that was sticking out and then I would hot glue that together but really it's just the lock washer holding the construction paper to the, the sports cone to the robot wheel to the motor and made it all one single unit and I did that for all three of the screws sticking out for both drills and then I now have this construction paper spiral uh, moving around and drilling so the next step for me was actually just to get a foam spiral together so I actually create the drill. Um, this actually proved to be uh, something that I couldn't just haphazardly walked into. I kind of just drew a spiral with the Sharpie onto the uh, the foam. I didn't look up any guides for this at all. I just kind of fired from the hip. It turned out to work okay. Uh, the spiral didn't match up quite well because I did it all by hand and I actually didn't even 
get a protractor or anything and try to draw a perfect circle. It was, it was, uh, it was getting late and I was tired. Um, so what I did to actually make the foam stick to the construction paper cone properly is I actually just did the same methodology. I took some uh, screws, I pushed them through the foam into the construction paper, and then took a bolt on the other end and bolted together. This actually worked really nicely to make sure that the foam stayed to the construction paper and kept the overall um, build light enough weight so it could spin easily. And pretty cool, it made it look like a little bit more robotic because you had these screw heads sticking out and actually made it look like it was fastened in a factory which actually added to the aesthetic instead of removing from it. The last step for the drills was to get them coated in the same PVA glue mixture, uh, about two or three coats and then did another coat of plastic dip on top. And then from there it was just painting them, getting them all nice and shiny and I was done. I had two drills, I had the body set to go with the LEDs on front and I just needed to get some black clothing and get out there on the show floor. And that was it. All in all, it took me probably about two, two and a half weeks to get it all said and done. Um, and a lot of trips to Home Depot and the craft store. I was doing it after work and on weekends, so we really kind of the timing was hard to keep track of. But it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot in the process, and I also had a lot of fun making it. At HRX, I wore it for probably about two hours, and I have to be honest with you guys, I was super nervous to do it. As I was walking out, it was one of those things where you just and maybe this is what cosplayers are really into, but you get that spotlight effect where it just everyone's like, what in the world is standing in front of me? What 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 is all this? Right? And so I like, kinda of walk it out. And I think because my head was sticking out, I was just like, I know that person, but what what is this, right? So it's cool because I got to be the very first cosplay for bot smashers in the world. Um, wasn't the best thing ever, but it was pretty cool. It was a lot of fun and good to show off. So I'm excited to see what people make uh, after the fact when the game comes out. Um, and at the same time, it also gave me a really big appreciation for what cosplay is. So having done it myself and gone through this process, I can now appreciate the, all the hard work and effort that goes into making a great cosplay on top of the acting and the embracing you have to do when you're there, right? So walking out, I was kind of just, hey, I'm, 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 a, I'm a bot. But just looking at some of the crazy cosplays you see at events, especially at our events, because we had some really cool like Alquan cosplays and Morgan cosplays and Thoth cosplays walking around. When they're in character, there's an extra level of effort to embrace what it is that you're trying to show off to the public, right? So the way you stand, the way you make your facial gestures, the way you interact with people, and how you carry yourself applies to the overall aesthetic of the cosplay itself, not necessarily just putting the cosplay together. For me, I actually enjoyed making the cosplay more than I enjoyed wearing it, probably because I didn't have good padding and it was made of wood and it was kind of heavy and it was digging into my clavicle and my shoulder started to hurt a lot. Um, but I think it's also just, I like the, the just using my hands and creating something and actually trying to overcome challenges as they're presented. I love challenges and I love learning new things. So I think that just fit my wheelhouse really nicely. But it was great to just really go through the whole process myself, see it end to end, see how the sausage is made, and then gain that nice appreciation. There's actually some of the cosplayers, we did a, a cosplay tournament um, or a cosplay contest at HRX. Some of the cosplayers talked to me about how they do the cosplay and what it took to get into that cosplay, and it blew my mind. The winner, the first place winner of the cosplay contest this year at HRX was the Al Kuang, and he told me that it took him six hours to get ready to get into the cosplay and did everything put together because there's a lot of special effects makeup and little bits he had to put on his on his skin and then things that kind of put him and eye makeup and everything it took six hours to get that all together and it it makes me think back to movies you know when you you have like the thing in in Fantastic Four where they have to put all the it's just crazy how much time and effort they go into being that character and for people to do that on their own time out of their own passion is something that just melts my heart and makes me so excited to know that there's things out there that light people on fire in that way. So that's going to be it for this video guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like this kind of content, throw a like down below, leave me a comment, let me know this is something you'd like to see more of in the future. Maybe I'll just go around making random things and just crafting stuff and talking about how I do it or you guys can get suggestions on what you'd like to see. But let me know because I'm curious about what kind of content you guys are interested in seeing um, and just show your support from that end. But that's going to be it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.